Okay, I'll try and uh, record the session. I think we are almost all here. Whoever is not around, there's very little that we can do. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to share with you some slides. I gave the topic, but uh, there's a bit of some, what's the word? Some change that I've done. So hopefully we can we can still learn something and see how far how far this session takes us. This is uh, seventeen zero eight at the moment. Yeah, so we'll start and see how far how far we can go. Okay, so this is a a big obstetric emergency. I'm sure you've you've heard about shoulder dystocia. Um, I've seen uh, when you ask medical students about shoulder dystocia, looks like they get lost. Uh, when you say, write down, for instance, absolute indications for cesarean section, they would write shoulder dystocia, many of them. So I keep wondering what is the problem? Yeah, but then we'll go through and then see uh, if we can discuss the problems I've seen. Um, when I look at, when I look at your exams and then there's shoulder dystocia there. Okay, so you can see my slides, isn't it? Yes, doc. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so really I've put a very simple picture there uh, for you to picture what shoulder dystocia is. So the way the head of the boy is, is that the, it has come out. This boy is trying to come to our side. Yeah, uh, this boy is trying to negotiate the head and the body through this, uh, this gate and they want to come to our side. And the head has come out. Now the shoulders are really stuck. They can't, they can't get in and they can't go back. That is what really shoulder dystocia is. The head has come out, but there's no way of the head going back and also there's no way of the shoulders getting through because they are stuck. So there are different ways of defining shoulder dystocia. One way is that um, the basic maneuvers that we use, the basic maneuvers that we use to deliver the shoulders during a normal labor are not able to make the shoulders pass through, uh, through the outlet. So if you've been if you've been to labor ward, you will see that um, we try and have some traction downwards towards the mother's uh, sacrum. That's usually the basic maneuver that we use to deliver um, the anterior shoulder for, for the baby. Then we deliver the posterior shoulder. That's how normal labor normally goes. But in this case, that basic maneuver fails to deliver the anterior shoulder. That's one definition of uh, shoulder distortion. The second definition is that um, it takes you more than a minute to try and deliver the body after the head has come out. So it's, it's kind of that you need additional maneuvers other than the basic maneuvers to get the shoulders uh, through uh, the pelvic outlet and then hence the, the whole body. So that's what uh, shoulder dystocia is. So it's very, um, it's, it's a very rare emergency, um, depending on who you ask. So it's somewhere around 1% and so on. Um, it's unpredictable. So you can't say, oh, the way this baby is, there'll be shoulder dystocia. It's not possible to tell. And this is also a common, um, multiple choice question asking us about uh, how, how predictable shoulder dystocia is. You cannot predict shoulder dystocia. So if you see a multiple choice question talking about predictability of shoulder dystocia, you cannot predict it. There are risk factors like uh, big baby, uh, diabetes, uh, post-death pregnancy, a prolonged second stage, an obese mother, um, a use of instrumental uh, instruments to deliver, like uh, use of an instrumental delivery and all those things. 
are kind of risk factors for shoulder dystocia, but there's no way of knowing which baby will end up with shoulder dystocia and which baby won't end up with shoulder dystocia. Uh, people say they, they've even seen shoulder dystocia happen in a two kg baby. So that is something that can, uh, can happen. So you cannot uh, predict shoulder dystocia. Some people go to an extent of saying that, and this is a, another common MCQ question, that um, trying to deliver babies by C-section in diabetic mothers before they get to a high weight can reduce the risk of shoulder dystocia. It cannot reduce the risk of shoulder dystocia as well. So because you can't predict who will have shoulder dystocia and who will not have shoulder dystocia. So how you make a diagnosis, we've already gone through it. So you need to see that the shoulders are stuck behind the pubic bone. And normally it will take you more than 60 seconds to, to deliver the shoulders. Then you say a shoulder distortion. Then you will need additional maneuvers to, uh, to deliver the shoulders. And then that would make you call it shoulder distortion. There's what is called the turtle's sign, which is that the, baby, the baby's head has come out, but you cannot appreciate the neck, which is the picture that you have, the first one, picture one. So you cannot appreciate the neck. The neck is way inside, and this is a bad sign because it means that the shoulders are way high, way, way higher than where the pelvic outlet is. So it means that even for you to maneuver the baby out, it's going to be very difficult because the shoulders are way high. That's why you have the tetos sign. It's a very bad prognostic sign because it means that the shoulders are very high, so high that you cannot even appreciate the neck. Then the other sign that you can, uh, that can help you make a diagnosis of shoulder dystocia is lack of restitution. You remember in the mechanism of labor, you have internal rotation. When you have internal rotation, when the baby is delivered in extension, the, the neck, which had kind of twisted uh, during internal rotation has to untwist. That is what is called restitution. So when that restitution fails to happen, it means that the shoulders are stuck inside. So they cannot move with the fetal neck. And therefore the, the fetal head fails to, uh, to restitute. So that's how uh, this happens. So the other thing is that um, you know that the shoulders are delivered in an oblique diameter. In the middle picture, you can see that the shoulders are directly anteroposterior. That can, can be a risk for this uh, shoulder distortion because the shoulders are failed to rotate into that oblique diameter, which is a bigger diameter, and therefore they are stuck behind the, um, uh, the pubic symphysis or they are stuck behind the sacrum. So this shoulder distortion can be bilateral where both uh, it's stuck anteriorly and posteriorly, but commonly it's, all, it's almost always stuck anteriorly because in the sacrum, there is the hollow of the sacrum, there's some space there. So it's rare that the shoulders get stuck posteriorly. Most of the time the shoulders will get uh, stuck anteriorly on the, on the pubic um, uh, symphysis. So that's really how you, uh, you make a diagnosis of uh, shoulder distortion. Then we move on to what to do. Before we move on to what to do, we can say what not to do. So you can see how this uh, baby is stuck or this uh, boy is stuck. This is really what a shoulder distortion is. So imagine holding the head and pulling this baby out. There's no way this baby or this boy is going to come out by you pulling on it. Even if you tell the mother to push, you are just making it worse. You are going to just impact the shoulders more and more because pulling and pushing cannot solve this, uh, this problem. Um, you cannot do an episiotomy to solve this problem because you can see that the head or the shoulders, which are born, are stuck to another bone. So there's, you can do an episiotomy, it won't help you. It won't help you because uh, shoulder dystocia is a bony problem. So the shoulders are stuck behind another bone. 
So there's when you cut during your episiotomy, you are not really solving uh, solving the problem because the the tissue of the perineum is not contributing uh, to the obstruction in this case. So no pulling, no pushing, and no fundo pressure. Again, fundo pressure is just you pushing against the wall again. So you can't just pull and push. Uh, that does not help. What will happen if you pull and push is damage. Like what's happening to this track on your right side. It's another example that you have a bridge which is too low. The head of the track has passed. Then the, the trailer is failing to pass because it's too high. You can't solve this problem by just pushing and pushing and pulling because you just damage the track. And that's what happens in shoulder dystocia many times. Uh, the baby gets... Uh, the humerus fractured, the clavicles fractured, it gets a brachial plexus injury because people are just are pulling and pushing and not thinking through what the real problem is. So the only way to, to get this baby out is really to use some maneuvers as the previous pictures have shown. So before you do any maneuvers, of course, you need to call for help. So help will come for different things, to help you with the maneuvers, to help with the resuscitation, uh, especially if you, uh, the one who's there doesn't have some skills to resuscitate, doesn't have some skills to maneuver the baby, then you need to call someone who has those skills because if you try and do something uh, drastic, you just cause injury to the baby. And you need help for somebody to write what's going on. So you need to take note of the time that the head has been delivered because you only have five minutes to get this baby out. When you go beyond six minutes, most babies get asphyxiated, most babies die, and they die because there's cord compression. Sometimes the placenta detaches after the head comes out. So you are really um, fighting against time. So you need uh, these five minutes to make sure this baby is out. You need to make sure that the, uh, the bladder is not full because that will be part of the obstruction. You need to make sure that you position the mother at the edge of the bed and uh, make sure you have enough uh, lighting in the, in the place where you're delivering from. The purpose of the maneuvers, of course, can be to try and increase or change the shape of the pelvis, uh, try to decrease the shoulder diameters, and just try to change the way the pelvis is relating to the shoulders. And then that sometimes would, um, would make um, a delivery happen. Um, the other note which has to be made about the maneuvers is that there's no really special maneuver. There's no maneuver that works all the time. There's no maneuver that has the least risk to cause a fetal injury. So it's a matter of choosing the maneuver that you are confident with, uh, maneuver that you are comfortable with uh, to start with. And then uh, you move on to the more complicated maneuvers and so on and complicated according to the skills that the, the operator has. So that's, that's how uh, the issue of maneuvers uh, works. So I'll put this one as a first line maneuver. And the reason I'm putting it as a first line maneuver is, is really because that's what I do first. Uh, when a baby gets stuck and I'm caught that there's a shoulder distortion, I would, I normally would try this maneuver. So. The maneuver is really not to pull straight towards you, but it's kind of um, like the midwives do all the time. You try and put some traction of the fetal head downwards. So you are, you are leaning towards the hollow of the sacrum, trying to make the, uh, the shoulders come down through the, the anterior shoulder deliver through the pubic symphysis. So you're just um, kind of maneuvering the head, gentle, steady um, traction. So maybe the one who was there first didn't do this properly. It really depends on who has called you and so on. So this is what I would normally start with. And um, if you are confident uh, with the one who's there and you've assessed what's going on, you might not need to try this. You might need to move on to the other ones. But I normally would try this because um, Normally the one who scored me is um, 
junior and I'm thinking maybe they didn't do it properly. So I try, I try this first. Then the second um, common maneuver that people try again, uh, these are MCQ questions. You need to know what a macrobats maneuver is. So a macrobats maneuver is really a flexing uh, the hips and flexing the knees and abducting the hip so much that the knees reach the, the nipples of the mother. Really, that's what you're doing. So this maneuver kind of um, straightens the sacrum and raises the pubic symphysis up, kind of changes the shape of the, um, of the pelvic cavity so much that it's easier for the, um, it's easier for traction to be done effectively. And sometimes this kind of change in the shape of the, a pelvis makes the shoulders easy to deliver uh, below the pubic symphysis. So this is this is called the um, macrobats maneuver. You can the patient can try to do it by themselves, or you can have assistants do it. Maybe one on the left side handling the left uh, lower limb, and the other one on the right handling the the right lower limb to have this um, macrobats uh, maneuver done. So the macrobats maneuver uh, usually gets most of the shoulders out with a little bit of some traction on the baby, uh, baby's head downwards. Then uh, the suprapubic pressure. And you need to remember again, this is an MCQ question where they say what, what uh, for shoulder distortion, you apply uh, fundal pressure. So they're trying to trick you into saying fundal pressure when the actual pressure you apply is, is um, suprapubic pressure and not fundal pressure. So you need to be careful of the, of the words being used, suprapubic pressure, fundal pressure, cervical pressure, whatever it is. So be careful to know that what you're applying is suprapubic pressure. The important thing here to note is that uh, you are not applying the pressure downwards you are applying the pressure in the direction of the arrow so that the shoulder diameter goes into the oblique diameter of the pelvis. The bisacromial diameter, which is the, the, the diameter of the two shoulders goes into the oblique diameter of the pelvis, which is a bigger diameter so that the baby's shoulders can be de delivered below the, the pubic symphysis. So that's what uh, suprapubic pressure does. So you can do suprapubic pressure in combination with um, with the macrobats maneuver to help with um, with delivery, so you can use both maneuvers at the same at the same at the same time. Yeah, so you can use both maneuvers or at the same time to help deliver uh, the shoulders. The key is what I've said that you're not pushing the, the shoulders necessarily downwards. It's downwards and outwards. And the stance that you have is like the one we have when we are doing um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So cardiac massage. So you are pushing it on this other side with that stance so that you're not just pushing the shoulders downwards because you just break the clavicles. So you're pushing it so that the shoulders go into the oblique diameter, which is a bigger diameter, and then they can slide uh, below the pubic bone and, and come out. So that's what you need to remember about uh, suprapubic pressure. Uh, then you can also do uh, what is called Gaskin's maneuver. And again, these are maneuvers that you need to remember by name for the MCQs, which is that the mother is uh, like putting her arms and legs down. She's sitting in all fours as, as is indicated there. So this also changes the shape of the pelvis compared to when she's lying down and it might be easier to maneuver uh, the fetal shoulders out of the pelvis. So you can, 
you can kind of put traction downwards in the, with the mother in this position, or you can put traction upwards with the mother in this position. This helps also because you've changed the shape and the orientation of the pelvis, and therefore it might be easier uh, for you to maneuver uh, the shoulders out of um, out of the pelvis. So this is called Gaskins uh, Gaskins maneuver. Then, so what we've done so far are called first line maneuvers. So now we are go going to uh, second line maneuvers. These are kind of like internal uh, internal maneuvers. So you have Rubin's maneuver, you have uh, corkscrew maneuver, and you have this maneuver where you deliver the posterior arm of the fetus. So in Rubin's, what is really happening is that you are taking your hand inside um, the pelvis and finding the anterior shoulder. And then you are pushing the anterior shoulder, you are pushing from the back of the anterior shoulder so that again, that shoulder goes in the oblique diameter. It's kind of what you are doing when you are doing a suprapubic pressure. But now you are inside, putting your hand on the posterior shoulder and pushing it in the oblique side so that it goes in the oblique diameter and delivers the shoulder uh, below the pubic symphysis. So that's what you are doing in Rubin's uh, maneuver. In corkscrew maneuver, you are kind of like unscrewing, unscrewing the shoulders. So you are trying to move the posterior shoulder anteriorly so that the posterior shoulder becomes the anterior shoulder. So as you do that um, maneuver, that 180 degree turn of the posterior shoulders moving anteriorly, then um, that also helps the shoulder, even the anterior shoulder itself to deliver below the, uh, the pubic symphysis because of that uh, screwing the rotation. You know that once you screw something, it becomes weaker and uh, it comes out the way a screw comes out. So you are rotating it in the, with the idea that as you screw it, it will deliver below uh, the fetal shoulders. Then the last maneuver is really just you trying to get to the posterior shoulder and finding the upper limb, finding the arm of the posterior shoulder and making sure you deliver that posterior shoulder. All you have to make sure is that you are moving the shoulders or you're moving this arm in a natural direction. So you know where the elbow is, you know where the shoulder is so that you don't go in a direction that breaks the baby's shoulder or the baby's arm. So that's the, the thing you have to know which side is flexion, which side is extension as you hold on to the arm so that you deliver it first. And then once you deliver one arm, of course the diameter, the bisacromial diameter reduces because one arm is out. So once that one arm is out, then the other shoulder will obviously uh, deliver now. So this is a maneuver for delivering the uh, the posterior arm. The only thing you have to remember is that you need to do these maneuvers, this particular one, in a direction that will not will not break the uh, the arm. So that's that's about um, this particular one. Then there are these third line maneuvers, which are really he heroic maneuvers and. Uh, most of the time, the baby is not in a good state for someone to end up with these maneuvers. Pleidotomy means that you break, you do um, fracture of the shoulders, of the shoulder bones or the clavicles uh, so that the bisacromial diameter gets reduced and the baby is delivered. Uh, symphysiotomy means you cut the symphysis pubis, um, that joint there. So once the joint is cut, then it's open and the shoulders can come out. Then there's what is called Zabanelli's maneuver. Zabanelli's maneuver is kind of reversing the mechanism of labor. So you kind of um, relax the uterus, maybe with uh, some drug that relaxes the uterus, uh, tebutaline, maybe nifedipine, like a tocolytic. And then you flex the head and kind of try and, and make sure it's in an anterior posterior position. Um, it's occipital posterior, it's occipital anterior, for instance, and then you kind of try and push the head 
back into the uterus and then end up with a cesarean section. So that is called the Zabanelli maneuver, but no one does it. These are really heroic maneuvers. And if we are doing this, there's a lot of morbidity uh, for the mother and for the baby. And usually there is no need to do uh, these procedures because you normally end up with a, with a dead baby. Cladotomy may be when you have a dead baby. The dead is already, the baby is already dead and uh, you want to deliver. So you, that, that can, can be done, not in a live baby normally. So then after delivery, you need to take note that there'll be a very high risk of postpartum hemorrhage. There'll be uh, possible cervical tears because of all these maneuvers. Uh, the neonatal condition uh, will be very poor. That's why at the beginning, when in your preparation, you need to make sure the resuscitator is well prepared. There'll be neonatal injuries. There's um, brachial plexus injuries. There's humerus fractures. There's um, clavicular fractures. There's uh, asphyxia and all those things for the fetus that um, are going to happen in shoulder dystocia. So that is um, for the fetus. Then, um, then you need to document uh, your findings. So you need to document time the baby delivered. You need to document which one was the posterior shoulder, which one was the anterior shoulder. Um, you need to document the maneuvers which were performed. You need to document the staff who are in attendance and you need to document the uh, the condition of the of the baby. So that's that's about uh, shoulder dystocia. Um, I don't know why this Zoom is saying six minutes. Um, yeah, but anyway, that's that's about shoulder dystocia and the the basics of it. I don't know if any of you has um, some questions about it before we move on to any other thing that we have. Yes, Dr. Shanzi. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that in, in the shoulder dystocia, it's not normally the, the morphology of the baby. It's the bones that see, that's like, uh, get deformed, that causes uh, shoulder dystocia. So from like, for me, I thought, I, I've been always believing that, uh, Shoulder dystocia, it's when the, the baby mo is too big. I didn't know that it's uh, something to do with the bones. Thank you. I think shoulder dystocia has to do something with the bones. We are saying that it's the bones that are stuck. So the shoulder, the shoulder has bones and the pelvis has bones. So the, the shoulders are stuck behind a bone. So you can't solve that problem by pulling. Of course, it's more common if a baby is big because, because if the baby is big, the bisacromial diameter, which is the from one shoulder to the other, that length is very big. So it means that that kind of baby is more likely to, to get stuck. So it's more common in big babies, but the point about the bones is that the shoulder has a bone and the pelvis has a bone and the shoulder is stuck behind the, the pubic symphysis. So you can't solve this problem by pulling and pushing because the problem, yeah, it's not a soft tissue problem. That's why you can't solve it by doing an episiotomy as well. So I forgot to mention that um, episiotomy is really only done if you think that it helps you put your hand inside the pelvis more easily. It creates space for you to put your hand inside and be able to do those maneuvers we described. Then, uh, then, then we can do an episiotomy, but if they don't help you with space or putting your hand inside the, uh, the vagina or inside the pelvis, then, then you shouldn't do a, an episiotomy if it's not assisting you with the maneuvers, with you pushing your hand inside. Is there any other question? Or, um, yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, Dr. Sens, uh, I, I heard you say that we are, uh, when you're doing maybe uh, the baseline of maneuver, uh, we are not allowed to do the fundal 
pressure. Yes. Kind of pressure. Uh, how do you do the suprapubic pressure? I saw a picture about uh, how fundal pressure is done, but uh, the suprapubic uh, pressure, which is allowed in this case, uh, how do you go about it? No, I showed you, I didn't show you a picture of how fundal pressure is done. This picture is showing suprapubic pressure. Oh, because okay. you, can, oh. you can see here, this is the where my arrow is pointing, is the pubic symphysis. Okay. So this is suprapubic pressure. And this, the, the picture on your left is showing you in what direction you are pushing. Because if you are pushing just direct down, you are just breaking the clavicles for this baby. You need to push in that direction because what you want is the, the shoulders to go in the oblique diameter. Then they'll come out because the oblique diameter is a little, a slight, slightly bigger or longer than the anterior posterior diameter. So this, what I've shown here is um, suprapubic pressure, not bundle pressure. Yeah. Is there any other concern? Yeah. Or oh, this is clear enough. If we have any, okay. Anyway, um, if you've understood. I think that if we have any question on shoulder distortion, this, it should be easy. Because the key about shoulder distortion is understanding the problem. If you understand what the problem is, you are not going to do funny things to try and deliver the baby because you know exactly what the problem is. The problem arises because people don't understand what problem is there. So they end up doing some funny, um, funny maneuvers to try and deliver the baby and then it causes more harm uh, for the baby and the mother than, than the help they're trying to provide. Any other concern? Um, yes, Dr. Shanti. Um, for, <clears throat> since you say that a complication for shoulder dystocia is also brachial plexus palsy. Um, so is it that every child who has, who has had a brachial plexus palsy, is it because of shoulder, they, at some point they had shoulder distortion? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So we only have a minute, but I'm going to answer that. Um, yeah, brachial plexus injuries are very common, not even in shoulder dystocia because of the delivery itself. And we know that the baby is passing through the bony pelvis you can have a brachial plexus injury even without a shoulder distortion. Then the other thing that I didn't comment on that what your question reminds me is that most of these injuries actually patients recover without any, any problems. But the problem with, um, which is why I say that we should indicate which shoulder was anterior, which shoulder was posterior in the knots because there's a lot of litigation associated with shoulder distortion. People are sued because they broke, they broke a shoulder. Uh, during uh, during delivery and so on. So it's important to, to indicate which shoulder was anterior, which shoulder was posterior, and that 